so I see with your work, I see two things. I see, well, more than that, of course, but as far as when we think about the future and projecting into the future, I mean, you're providing, you're not just saying like the reasons as to why all these things are happening. You also give reasons or you give paths forward as far as how to, like, what do people do to make sure that this type of these epidemics and, and pandemics don't ever emerge again? You know, what would a healthy relationship with our food production look like, right? And I mean, human beings have been able to have a healthy relationship with food for a long time. And we've had various systems, the one that we're currently embedded in within right now that obviously is very unhealthy for us as human beings and also for more than human life and for the earth. I mean, it's just really obvious. So you obviously have that path forward. So before we get to that, I just want to I want to kind of continue on this bleak path that we've been going down here and then we'll turn to something maybe a little bit more like what what can be done so as i mentioned earlier uh, almost in passing um we're now in I, I think we're like in the age of plagues we're like the age of, of pandemics it's like if covid it has a one to two percent fatality rate i can't it's hard. It's not that hard for me to imagine that something else could emerge that could be up in the higher percentages of fatality, mortality rate. Right? Yeah. Do you sense that that's like very realistic? That, in a way, that that's kind of what you're expecting based on the trends. I mean, what do you? What I guess as far as the future of pandemics or epidemics go, um, what are you maybe worried about, or what do you anticipate could or would happen? Yeah, so the, the, you, we really are on the Dr. Doom uh, trail here. So uh, we we'll, yeah, we're... We'll, but I, I would very much like to circle back to your point about way out because um, yeah, I think what I do is if I have an instinct in that uh, the terrible direction, it's only because um, you know I really want people to kind of unplug out of the uh, premises of empire that. Uh, pats us on our head and says everything's going to be all right mm -hmm. and i mean generally speaking i think that um humanity has a capacity to think through the problem and get to where we need to go to to uh right things in a, in a good direction we are, are in a terrible spot though however and we have to be real about it and we have to be open about it and we have to you know have a conversation like adults to work through what the nature of the problem is and uh, those who are responsible for providing answers or even telling us what the questions are, are fully embroiled in the system that brought about the damage. So, you know, I've spoken ill of, of one of the liberal heroes, Anthony Fauci. I've spoken ill of, um, you know, some of the other uh, players involved who, despite their brilliance, are also in, um, in, involved in, in keeping the system going. And I, I've been very adamant about it. I've, you know, if you want the details, you can find them in uh, Dead Epidemiologists, uh, my latest book about it. And, but I, I, I will say uh, that it is incredibly important to, to think, to unplug us out of our, the ideological machine and to think through more about what does it mean to be in a, a people who stand up on their feet and, and not only make choices, meaning uh, the empire will provide you choices to choose from perhaps, but to make decisions, meaning you think through what the nature of the problem is and how do we together work and maneuver our way out of this um, and out from underneath uh, the apologist who brought the problem upon us. So that's why I get heavily into the doom stuff because uh, you know the the notion I think you brought up was that, you know, everything's going to be all right from what we hear. Or, uh, and and it, it is very important to uh, unplug out of that to really get at the um, trap that was sprung upon us. Um, and uh, and to we really have to underscore what that trap involves and what it was the trap now. And you got to it, right? The age of pandemics, you know, obviously climate change is mixed in there as well. Uh, and these are what the philosophers call hyper objects, meaning they're problems that are everywhere all at once. And, um, you know, it used to be the 500 years of capitalism basically concentrated all the damage of capitalism to the global south around the equator. So millions of black and brown people were killed every year. But that was the damage. And, uh, you know, we ended up with 20% of the world's population using 80% of the world's resources. That continues today. 
but the damage is so extensive now and they they smashed the uh the regenerative biology of the system as well as the, the social aspects of the system that you know social commons upon which we all depend that now the damage is everywhere all at once that's what climate change is that is what a pandemic is mm -hmm. so the you know we managed I mean, there are people here in the global north, obviously, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, South Chicago or, or South Los Angeles or anywhere, South Bronx, who are a, a global south unto themselves uh, and that they are treated terribly within the global north system. But for the most part, at the global level, all that damage was directed um, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for once, you know, we're starting to have our hand on the stove that, you know, we, we lit um and feeling the burn and acting surprised but you know if you engage in a uh, capitalist system that is so divorced from the ecology upon which it depends then that damage was utterly ine inevitable mm -hmm. and um and the uh, pathogens are, are a natural consequence of that of that damage and so um you know, you know since the turn of the century we had a whole bunch of uh, new pathogens I mean, the, the rate of new disease emergences has been clocked in as being uh, increasing, the, the tax of, of pathogens is increasing. And um, you know, a lot of them are RNA viruses, but they're not all, and they're somewhat quite different from each other, which speaks to the scope of damage that we've uh, um, followed up in. So, you know, we've got the, um, the avian influenzas, the swine influenzas, we have SARS-1 in 2002, MERS in 2012, uh, SARS-2, COVID-19 in 2019. So that's like uh, three deadly coronaviruses in only 18 years. And, um, uh, you know, the one, two percent that you, you, you know, we've quoted here, it's, it doesn't mean it's that at all. You know, you're right. It could be uh, clocking in at, what, what do we do with the 10 percent? Or, you know, Ebola was clocking in at 90 percent at, at one point. And you know, wiping out uh, whole villages in sub-Saharan Africa. So Ebola, of course, but he had the one in 2013 uh, that emerged genetically is very similar to the other Ebolas. But how did it go to infecting 35,000 people and killing 11,000 people? Right. How did it spread across three countries and then almost make it and get on a couple planes or two, right? So right. all these previously marginalized pathogens are finding uh, new outlets by which they can spill over out of uh, you know, immediately, you know, you know a deforestation uh, that has driven by multinational agribusiness logging or, or mining and get on because of the uh, network of travel and trade that's developed under neoliberal capitalism can find itself on the other side of the world in a matter of weeks. And what that means is basically you're selecting for the deadliest pathogens because a pathogen that, um, is able to continue to access susceptible humans is one that you select for deadliness. If you're a virus in a host and you kill your host too fast, before the next host comes along, you basically cut off your chain of transmission. So for the most part, you tend to, you, those strains that don't evolve deadliness are the ones that are selected for. But if you know the next susceptible is coming along, then it selects for the deadliness because you can get to your uh, replication threshold and get into the next spot as soon as possible, you'll beat out the other strains. And because of the way uh, we've been able to move in a direction of interconnecting uh, one side of the planet to the other, both for our livestock and for, you know, just the human race overall, uh, something that might emerge, uh, in, in coronavirus that emerges out of South, South uh, Central China, or Laos or whatever they're, they're looking at now, uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, makes its way to, you know, in a matter of a couple of years, uh, circulates among uh, the, you know, Chinese um, workers or, uh, and finally makes its way to Wuhan and then gets on a plane and gets, you know, sprints around the world. And um, so, yeah, I mean, this is, this is going to be, it's not going to be another hundred years, you know, between a really terrible outbreak, say 1918, um, influenza and then uh, 2019 uh, coronavirus. I mean, every, everybody, it doesn't, not, you know, I'm gonna talk about everybody, not, not just my, all ages, whatever character, you know, whether they're you know, part of the Imperial project or not, knows that this is just the beginning of this. So we're going to see all sorts of different types of 
new pathogens emerge. When, I mean, when you do deforestation, you, you destroy a lot of the host species there. And so the, the, the pathogens that there uh, are reservoirs for, you know, they die out too. So sometimes a lot of these host species actually do much better in, the, in this new context. So you have like geese, when their wetlands are destroyed on the Gulf of Mexico, they migrate toward farms that are growing grain as far north as here in Minnesota. And so their populations explode inside, in size, and they're able to have a much uh, greater interface with the local um, poultry that are being grown. So the spillover rate increases. Bats also do quite, some bats do better uh, under deforestation. So then all of a sudden they can make it to the monoculture plantations. It's a oil palm and then do very well. There aren't any competitors, there aren't any um, uh, predators. There's a lot of space to migrate or fly from, you know, the um, roosting sites and their foraging sites. So in other words, the deforestation can allow some of these host species to do well, to increase the spillover rate and allow uh, pathogens to make their way out beyond merely some sub-Saharan village. And uh, so that's, that's all over the place. It's not just China, it's not just Africa. It explains in part uh, what the emergence of swine flu H1N1 in 2009. Um, some of these viruses are emerging right deep from the, the local forests that are being cut into. Some of them are more toward the, the local regional capitals like the avian influenzas that are on the factory farms. So there's a circuit of production there that goes from the local city to the deep forest and pathogens are emerging all along the way in that circuit. And it's whether it's in Sub-Saharan Africa or China or the Middle East or, or in, in Mexico or the US. And that system is hand in glove with a capitalist system that you know, any damage uh, that it causes, if it destroys a local area by what's called a spatial fix, it moves into another area to start the process of deforestation and uh, commoditization all over again. And now that we're down to the last few forests left, it's not, doesn't select for good behavior. It's not, doesn't say, you know, agribusiness and other, you know, sectors don't go, oh, you know, we just not much forest left. We have to, you know, slow down at least, right? And no, it, it's uh, under what's called the Lauderdale's paradox. It selects for the last rush for what's available. Mm. So they're all, and you have to do it in, in, a, in a different way. This is where the, the new generation of greenwashing comes in, right? I mean, this is why the half earth uh, proposal of, you know, removing people off half the planet, so uh, are moving into cities, so to allow rewilding to happen, what you what they're doing is in effect uh, removing indigenous people and smallholders who historically have been excellent at that kind of rewilding and keeping nature going. I mean, what we know as nature was in essence an indigenous project in food forestry, mm -hmm. and so uh, getting rid of them would uh, not only uh, you know, uh, depress our capacity to actually uh, bring back uh, what we know as nature, but it also removes the last uh, real opposition to agribusiness moving in and, and using the last of the, those forests. So uh, in other words, you know, if, if they're going to protect nature, it's just another plantation uh, for the larger companies and or they'll just uh, wipe through the last of uh, the forestry. And so again, we're back to the sociopathic problem of um, you know, doing what's best for quarterly earnings at the expense of uh, the very fate of our species. So that, that is a truly dark place we ended up, but this is, uh, this is the, the trajectory that we're on and, and being very clear about uh, what that trajectory is is and is important because it really emphasizes the need to unplug out of the presumptions of of a you know capitalist system whether it's a conservative version or the liberal version or the fascistic version and to move in a direction where some sort of eco socialism by which uh, the well-being of the people on the planet is integrated with the well-being of uh, of the ecology upon which we all, we all depend on